Hi, this is Frank, and welcome back to The Next Realignment. In this episode, we're going to be talking about how America's political debate between liberalism and conservatism hasn't changed since the New Deal. All of American politics since the 1930s has been this same debate between liberalism and conservatism. These two ideologies that we created in the heat of the Great Depression to deal with this crisis of the Republic, this question of whether and how we needed to adapt the institutions of the American Republic to deal with a more complex industrial economy and ultimately a more complex modern world. That is met in practice that all of American politics since the 1930s eventually turned out to be a fight about the size and role of the federal government. The Democratic Party, which now represented its new ideology of New Deal liberalism, it sought to expand the power of the federal government, to create new agencies, create new institutions in order to carry out its ideological plan, which was to use expertise in social science to plan progress, progress that it hoped would benefit working people and the marginalized and the least well-off. While at the same time, the Republican Party, which now also represented a new ideology, this ideology of conservatism, it pushed back against what the Democrats were seeking to do, and it sought to propose limits. And it did so in order to protect other American values that it thought were at stake, these particularly values of liberty and Republican virtue. These were the most important questions America faced in the Great Depression, in the 1930s, and the decades to come. And they would be questions that would take decades to resolve, where we would have to try things out, make mistakes, roll things back, and the American people, they would have to engage in debates over time and eventually reach their own conclusions. But for us now, this fight between liberalism and conservatism, it's been going on for so long, it's the only thing any of us actually know. It's been the debate of politics for as far back as any of us remember. This is for us what politics has always been about. And for a lot of people, naturally, it's therefore seems to be what politics just is. Of course, we all know very differently, don't we? Because we know that this party system of Republicans and Democrats representing conservatism and liberalism, it's only one of five party systems. It's not the only way we've ever organized politics in America. We've had different party systems with different great debates, with parties organized around different ideas, debates that continued until they were resolved, and then they collapsed, and then we did it all over again. So we know that it stands to reason that our party system is just like the others. It was created to deal with a certain debate. That debate will go on for decades until it's resolved, and when it is finally resolved, and when new issues emerge, it will, just like the others, also collapse. But wait. Hasn't American politics already changed a lot since the 1930s? I mean, I keep saying that American politics since the 1930s has been the same debate between liberals and conservatives, a fight over Franklin Roosevelt and his New Deal. But we're not exactly fighting about Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal policies now, are we? I mean, we've had all kinds of issues that have entered our political discourse over the years, sometimes issues that show up in an election campaign and disappear, never to be heard from four years later, or... Sometimes the issues like the ones that came up in the 60s and 70s in both parties that over time came to loom larger in our political life than any of the original New Deal issues. And also, what about the changes in the political coalitions of our parties? I mean, at the start of the New Deal era, the Northeast, it was the bastion of the Republican Party. And today, the Northeast is pretty solidly Democratic, where in the 1930s, there was the solid South the South that was solidly democratic, an area that's now a fortress for the Republicans. All those changes are real and they're important. And they're important to this story of the fifth party system about how it's played out over time and where things are going in the future. But these changes are also ultimately a little bit superficial. They're changes in the way the parties have gone about their job, how they've expressed themselves, who've been attracted to them, but what they're not and what hasn't changed, 
They're not changes in the core ideologies of the parties. Since the 30s, what hasn't changed is this core fight between New Deal liberalism and modern conservatism. The Democratic Party since 1932 has been united around a party philosophy of New Deal liberalism, a party philosophy that it built out of what used to be two separate ideas, populism and progressivism. A lot of people today, we treat populism and progressivism as if they're merely aspects of the same thing, but we know that they are different ideas that appeal to different people for different reasons, and that in the era before the New Deal, we generally, in fact, even considered them often politically opposed. Now, progressivism, that's the idea that came out of the progressive movement, this idea that we can use social science to drive progress, particularly social and moral reform. The same way we use the scientific method in the natural sciences, we can use social science to create social and moral reform for the country by getting experts to study problems and find solutions. Populism, that's an idea as old as humanity. There's been populism wherever there's been human politics. And in America, particularly, it's been part of the Democratic Party, going back to Andrew Jackson. And populism is a very different idea that holds that society is broken up between a people, the ordinary people of the nation, and an elite, and that the people are under the rule of an elite who unfairly hold power over them. And so what a populist wants is to seize back control of dignity and power from the elite who unfairly holds power over the people. That's a very different idea from what a lot of people think populism is. There's this idea that's very common that what populists want is stuff, that the populist is angry that resources aren't flowing down to the people, that the people are on the bottom of society and the elite are enjoying too much, and that the populist wants the elite to shower more resources on the people. But that's completely wrong. What the populist wants isn't stuff and gifts from their rulers. They want to replace their rulers. They want to get more of the people in power. Because populism isn't about things, it's about dignity. So the Democratic Party since 1932 has been a party of New Deal liberalism that has justified everything it's done, everything it believes on these two big ideas, populism and progressivism, and often on both. And that was true in the early New Deal when they were talking about New Deal programs, but it's also true through the Great Society, through issues like environmentalism or racial justice, or gender equality. If you actually look at what Democrats have said, they've justified and framed all of these issues in terms of either progressivism, about planning progress, or in some term of populism, about a de a marginalized people who want to take back power and control from some kind of elite. Not only that, it's also how Democrats have always framed their criticisms of Republicans. Either they've looked at Republicans as somehow anti-progressive, that they are uh, standing in the way of science, they're rejecting knowledge, they're traditionalists who don't like change, or alternatively, that Republicans are some kind of elite. They're the rich who don't want to give up power and control from people who are marginalized and that they want to keep their status and privilege as elites. The Republican Party that came out of 1932 also was united around a philosophy, conservatism, and that philosophy was also built out of two ideas, two ideas that used to be sort of separate that are now combined into a new philosophy. And those two ideas are liberty and virtue. Liberty, that's an idea that's as old as America because the American Revolution was a revolution held in the name of liberty. And liberty it can be controversial to talk about because in philosophy, liberty can mean a lot of different things. There's a lot of different versions of liberty. There's everything from the positive liberties, this idea that human beings have to have certain things in order to be free, or there's the majoritarian liberty that came out of the French Revolution, or there's libertarianism. So there's a lot of different interpretations of liberty lying about. But in America, it has always meant one thing. In American politics, liberty has always meant, since the founding, this idea of resisting tyrannies in the majority. See, in the American Republic, to be free, 
the government is supposed to govern on behalf of everybody. No matter who elected the government into power, the people who are elected are not supposed to govern on behalf of that faction, not just on behalf of their voters. They're supposed to govern for everybody with everybody's interest at heart. And if the government starts acting on behalf of a faction, either trying to uh, siphon resources and power to that faction or to stomp on that faction's political enemies, that's considered, while legally permissible under the Republic, immoral and wrong and a, ty a tyranny. It is a type of tyranny no different than if it was done by a king because to the ex minority's perspective, it doesn't really matter if the person who's stomping on their neck is one guy who calls himself king or if it's a band of their fellow citizens who are working together in politics to do the same thing to them. The second idea is this idea of Republican virtue, this idea that's also as old as the Republic, but one that we don't talk about much anymore, this idea that in a Republic, in a democratic Republic, if the people are going to rule themselves, if they're going to be the government and select the government, they need to have certain traits of character for the government to survive. And it's something different that normal subjects of some kind of ruling government need. They don't need to have any special traits of character at all. But in a democracy, you need people with traits of character that put the republic first, that rule for the common good, or that have certain traits of character about how they live and work and how they run institutions, because all of those beliefs will influence who they elect and why they elect them, and then thus what the government does and whether it makes good decisions or poor ones. And so we needed to have these republican virtues inculcated through the citizens of society if a republic particularly the American Republic, is going to survive and thrive. If you look at everything the Republican Party has said and done since 1932, it's all been justified and framed around this idea of conservatism and in these terms of liberty or alternatively freedom and virtue or values. And that's true if you look at the early New Deal with issues like taxes and regulation, but it's also true with later Republican social issues like crime or welfare or moral values. And it's also true of everything that the Republican Party has said when they criticize Democrats. They criticize Democrats as either stepping on uh, liberty or acting like majority ruling tyrants, or alternatively, that they're undercutting American values somehow, or what they're doing is un-American. That's not to say, of course, that there haven't been some major changes in our parties since the 1930s. And if you just look at them, it's pretty obvious that there has. In the early New Deal era, our parties mostly focused on questions of economics, things like taxes and regulations. But as we started getting into the 1960s and then into the 1970s, we started talking in politics a lot more about issues like racial equality and the environment and gender equity and moral values, and abortion, and crime, and welfare. The Democratic Party, they still believed in New Deal liberalism. It's just that now they were applying their values from economic problems to social problems. They still believed that it was the job of government to use expertise and social science to drive progress that benefited working people and the marginalized and the least well off. It's just that they were now applying that philosophy to a new set of issues than before and the Republicans the same, when they moved into the same era, they also started looking at social issues, but they still believed in conservatism. They just were now applying conservatism from economic to social issues, where earlier in the era, they tended to push back against Democrats and economic so-called big government. Now they were pushing back against Democrats with so-called social big government. There's another thing that can throw people off, which is the changes in demographics. If you looked at the early New Deal era, the people who tended to support each party in the later era, the same demographic groups often swapped. People whose parents voted one way, their children voted some other way. People in a different generation formed different attachments, different values, and different beliefs. But that's not a change in the parties. The parties stayed the same. People changed. And it doesn't really matter, ultimately, which demographic groups you support. What matters is what you stand for and what you believe, and what the parties stood for and what they believed had never changed at all.
which, when you think about it, is really kind of crazy. I mean, the problems of the New Deal were the problems of an industrial economy. This crisis that had been brought on by the Great Depression and this new industrial America and the complexity of modernity. And the problems that we built these parties and their ideologies, liberalism and conservatism, to work through and debate, they're the problems of another time and place. We now live in a post-industrial economy, an information age economy, a global economy, in a very different world with very different problems from the ones that had caused the crisis of 1932. And yet we're debating these very different problems, if at all, under a framework built to deal with the industrial world and the problems of FDR. Thanks a lot for watching and make sure you tune in the next episode because we're about to start the next part of the series where we start looking in detail at our own party system, the fifth party system of liberals and conservatives up to its decline in the America of today.